So uh, let's talk about the program in general. And actually we have a very small group today. So if you wanna put into either the chat or the Q&A, what you would like me to cover, um, I'll make sure that um, I do that part because uh, there is so much to cover in this program um, that we never fit it all in an hour anyway. But I'm gonna give an overview of the program. And if you want something different than that, please feel free to let me know. Uh, and I will see what we can do. Okay, so what I am going to be showing you now is the cloud version. And this is the new beta version. You may have gotten an email if you are a cloud subscriber that we have this new beta version. So I'm going to show it to you here today. And if you want it, you only have to type in beta.flsgo.com. Excuse me. If you have a cloud subscription. So the new format. This is the old format, which is tabs on the top and then the menus down the left side. The new version has all the menus, no more tabs on top, has all of the sections um, that were the tabs uh, down the left side. And then when you open them, you see the other pages um, or menus for the sub pages there. And the whole thing can collapse when you get really good at the program. You won't need the, the text. You'll know what you're doing. And you can just collapse the video, I mean, the section there. And it will, uh, the menus, and it'll move over, giving you a little more screen real estate. So what we've got in the program is we've got four tabs or sections. We have entered data, analysis, reports, and settings. So settings is internal to the program. This is where you can get paper data sheets or change the state. You can also get a sample file, which is what I am using today. Um, if you ever want to play with the program, the sample file is a good way to do that. And then this also gives you assumptions and configuration screens. All of the information for the program, the, uh, the client's data goes into the enter data tab. Now we have menus here, um, sub pages that will allow you to focus on assets and liabilities, income and expense. You can enter data in any order. You can start anywhere. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You only have to fill a field out once and it's filled out in the program. So if Kim is really Kimberly, I can change that here in child support data for the children in the children's section. And if I went to parties and children and open the children's section, you can see that Kimberly is already changed because it's the same field. So I can change it back. And now in the program, it's gonna be changed. So know that you can do any order uh, that you'd like. If you're looking for a support calculation, that's where you wanna start. Then we have our child support data screens. Now these are divided into two pages. The quick, which only gives you part of all the data that you could enter, but in most cases, this will be sufficient. And then we have the complete page, which is everything you're used to seeing in the program. And basically all of the pieces of the support calculation for Minnesota, so that you can have an accurate and complete calculation. So you can start with the quick for a down and dirty, and then if you need some additional fine tuning for it, you can go into the complete and the data is the same. It'll be there for you. Now, um, on the quick, for example, when you're entering wages, there's just place for one wage for each person. 
if you have more jobs to put in more different employers um, or sources of income, then you'll want to go to the complete page where you can add another wage or another employer. Um, you can add wage-like income. And um, wage-like income being income from other than what's on the pay stub um, directly, the regular pay, and also not income from assets or from investments or businesses um, that they own. So if you want a business that they own, I would put in a business. So we go to income in it, uh, from investments and accounts. Here's our business income. You can have it calculate um, uh, automatically. And what you want to do is go to more information where you can fine tune the information for the business. And then you can do things like, sorry, let me scroll up here. Um, you can put in the value, the date of the valuation. So let's say it was uh, 5 30 2022. And what's the basis for the business if we're going to look at after tax, if they even know that? Um, you're also going to put in your cash flow. So, what I like to do is the income and expense worksheet. I click on that and I get here's my worksheet. It looks basically replicating a tax return or Schedule C from the tax return. Um, but you don't have to put in all the individual expenses. So you can see here, I've put in just gross revenue and I've put in a all expenses and just one expense number. I'm not really breaking it down. I may wanna break it down later. I can always go back and do that. Um, and then this gives me the net profit or loss on a monthly basis and an annual basis. Um, automatically. And that carries through then to the net cash flow of the business, which will show up um, here in the net cash flow. Okay. And then who gets that cash flow depends on where you assign the business, who's going to get the business. And then they will get the cash flow too. So when I am entering data myself, I like to go to assets and liabilities. And in the assets and liabilities, I can put in the asset and the cash flow. So now I've got an income and expense item already in when I'm doing my assets and liabilities. And the same would go for debts, let's say, if there are monthly payments, that's going to go to the budgets. Some things like investment income or business income is going to have a support consequence mortgage payment because the interest is going to be a tax deduction is going to have a support impact, but paying off the credit card, probably no support impact there. So the program will automatically know what to do with those things. So if I start with assets and liabilities, I've saved myself a little time because I can enter everything I know about each asset or liability, including the cash flow aspect of it. Um, now, what I really like to do, though, is I like to have the client enter the information. So I'm going to show you this on the desktop version because it's a little different in the new file manager that we have in the new beta cloud version. But here in the um, desktop and again on the um, cloud version, that's the pro.flsgo, you're going to register the client. And when you do that, it's going to ask you to put in their name and email address, the other party's name and the state. And then they will get an email inviting them to start entering the data themselves in the web data entry. When, <laughs> excuse me, 
when um, that email goes out, the user, I would get an email confirming that I've sent them a web data entry email. When they start working on it, you will get a second email that they've started working on, on the file, on entering data. And when they're done, they will be able to enter the data. Um, they will be able to, to enter the data, the market done, and you will get an email then saying they're done, they're ready for you to look at their data. So we can go into, in the beta version here, data as the client sees it. And here we go. This is what the information is going to look like for them. Um, and they can just put in whatever information they have. And when they're done, they're going to click the done for now at the bottom and you'll get an email. Now in the new file manager that is just coming out and you can play with it if you choose. The shared files are the ones that clients have entered data in. When we're done, when they're done, I can go in and look at that data or I can download it to become my file and look at it that way um, and lock their file so they can't make any more changes until you let them. So there will only be one client file per case um, for the clients to enter data into. If you reopen it or send it back to them to look to continue to add information, it will overwrite the file each time um, so that there's only one complete file. Um, it's easier than them getting confused and putting data in the wrong file. So now you have your child support data in, you can immediately go and look at the worksheets. So I can go to the guideline worksheet here and that takes me to the reports page for the child support guideline. And when we get there, you'll see that it's automatically computed and filled out the, all the information in the worksheet that you needed um, or that you've entered in that the program can use. We also have the parenting worksheet for the overnights, um, calculation and adjustment, then the child care worksheet. And we will let you put in all the case information there if it's not already been put in in the um, original data entry. So what can you do with the data once you have it entered? You can go to, of course, the guideline worksheet. We can also autofill the financial affidavit. So if I want to look at the disclosure form for Taylor, I can go to the financial affidavit and it's gonna pull it up and have entered in any data that I put in that, um, well, I don't have any, I don't have the right information in this file, but it would autofill it. So anything that's blue would be autofilled. I didn't go through and fill out that um, plaintiff uh, petitioner respondent kind of thing, um, but it's there. Anything that's a yellow field is a data entry field. If it's blue, it's a calculated field. That means that the program is putting in the data from elsewhere, um, either moving it over or calculating it, adding it all up, whatever. Um, so if there were more than one wage, for example, it would add up all the wages. So now this report is the view edit taxes report. What this really is, is a pro forma tax return for the current year and future years, depending on how many years you tell the program to go out. And we can go out up to 50 years in the future. There are assumptions involved in that, of course. So you wanna be careful about looking at future years if you haven't set the assumptions properly. Now, this will tell you things like, this will show you what that tax return is gonna look like 
so you can kind of make sure that you put things uh, in for the right person. Um, you can look at what that's going to look like. Oh, excuse me. And um, you're going to be able to see things like the marginal federal tax bracket, as well as the average federal tax rate, which is the actual tax rate for all the dollars, as opposed to the marginal tax rate, which is the highest tax rate that they're at for the next dollars in or the last dollars in. We also have, <laughs> excuse me, a budget report. Now, when the clients fill out the data themselves, I like to generate two reports right away that summarizes all the income and expense and all the assets and liabilities that they entered, which allow um, uh, the client to then to look at the information in a slightly different format and be able to review it and say, oh yeah, that's what I meant, or oops, there's a mistake here. So we have the budget report, and then I can go into more reports. And actually there are three pages there. So we're in the reports section under more reports. And there are three pages. There's for lawyers, for planners, and graphs. The planners page has a feature. It has more reports because there's more detail. But it has a feature that allows you to do multiple reports together as one PDF. So I will do a budget report, and which is number six and a property statement, which is number 17. And that encapsulates all the income and expense, all the assets and liabilities that have been entered in the program. And then I will open each one. And at the top, it will give me the ability to set options for the report. That is gonna allow me to decide what's gonna show or not show on the report. So if I look at the budget report options, I have many reports, many options here. I can do both parties. I can do only one. I can do just income or just expenses. I can also include or not include maintenance and child support in the initial budget, which is probably um, a good idea because you don't have all the information yet and the number's not gonna be right at this point and you're gonna give your client a heart attack. Um, here, I like to include the subtotal for taxes and to subtotal living expenses by category. Now, when I go back, there's no support anymore. I've got all the income, then the taxes, and now I've got categories for the expenses. It's just a little easier to read. And this budget report is now ready for um, my, my printing of it. I would do the same with the property statement report. I happen to um, like certain things. So I will usually include title and valuation date and not include a graph because there's no asset allocation on this report. And now when we go back, you can see I have columns for these things. And there are no valuation dates except for the one I entered a few minutes ago. Excuse me. No, here's another valuation date. So, okay, we've got all this information. I'm going to then take those two reports and PDF them and send them to the client. Here's a copy of what you submitted. Please review it, make sure it's accurate and complete. It's great, right? Um, then you can decide if you want them to give you the information back, the changes um, in some particular format. Do you want them to mark up the PDF? Do you want them to put it in an email? Or you can allow them to, um, uh, re-enter the data in the um, in the program in in their file, so I can go to the shared files and open it up, or in the desktop version or the pro version, not the beta. I can I have a, a button here that will say send back, 
and I can send it back once I've downloaded it. Now, the interesting thing is that because there's only one file, you have to be sure that you're not um, messing anything up. So any changes you've made, you're actually sending the file back to them. Um, it's going to have those changes and then they can make their own changes. We do not have red lines or markups on in our program. So you won't necessarily know what they've changed unless you compare it every field. Now, when you're entering data, there's two things you should know. We have footnotes and we have more information. So footnotes in the cloud version is this little blue box with the comment with the little thought bubble there. And when there's nothing in there, there's going to be just the three dots and it looks blank. If I put something in there, I can make this estimated. I can put in any text I want in the footnote field and I can save it. And now the footnote field will be filled in. So you can see the difference in these two footnote fields. This means there's something in there. I can also make this into a reminder. So it won't print as a footnote and I can put some private text in here. Maybe that you wanna work on something or say double check this, okay. So I can make that a reminder. Now, the only place I'm gonna see that reminder is in the footnotes report, which you will find in reports, more reports. And when I go to the top of the planners page, it's there, it's actually at the bottom of the lawyers page. So I usually go to the planners page because it's just easier. And here's my reminder. I can click on the blue um, uh, bubble there and I can, now I, I see that I, I've double checked this. I can take out that language, make it a footnote now, and it's gonna change to a footnote. So it was a reminder before and now it's a footnote. And now it'll print in um, my reports and so on when I've set it to print. Okay, so now you've got all the data in. Let's look at some of the other reports. We've got, uh, in addition to more reports, we have the marital property division report. I like to think of this as sort of the end result, who's gonna get what. And family law software does the balance sheet for you and you can do all of the division of assets. Now to divide the assets, you can do it a few different ways. When you're entering data, if I go to the assets and liabilities page, for example, it's gonna give me some data entry options at the top of the page. When I open that, one of the data entry options is going to be a default percentage to the first party entered. So you can do no default. Fine, we'll figure it out later. Or you can start out with 50-50 or by title. Of course, that is um, only going to be for new um, information entered, new data entered. So the um, stuff that I already have in, where I say it's not going to Taylor, if I change that here and do it as an automatic 50-50, it's not going to change these percentages. It's only going to change something new that I enter in. So I usually do no default because I have the clients entering the data anyway, but um, it's a cool feature when it's appropriate. And then it's, you can also assign, so that's way number one. The second way you can assign assets is asset by asset, liability by liability. Who's gonna get what? So you can say this one is gonna go 30% to Taylor or 50% or whatever you want it to do. But 
for myself and for most of us, we like to see the whole picture when we're doing that. So let's go into the analysis tab and we're gonna go down to the property section and we're gonna go to the first page here, divide property between the parties. And what that is going to give us is a balance sheet. And it's sort of a balance sheet on steroids because you can never break it or ruin it. So here's that 30% that I just put in for the Bank of America and it automatically calculates it. If I change the percentage, it will automatically change the numbers on both sides of the equation. If I change the number, it will automatically change the percentages and the number on both sides of the equation. So this is a great balance sheet. It's gonna give you a running total. We have some options for this balance sheet. Um, I can show a bar chart or a pie chart. The pie chart is how the assets and liabilities are overall being divided. So this is basically a pictorial view of a graphic view of the total marital equity here in numbers. Or I can show a bar chart, which also shows me un unallocated. So as I'm going through, if I haven't allocated everything, it would remind me by making that yellow and showing a dollar amount in the unallocated. Now it also can show me how far with one click the parties are from 50-50 or any other percentage. So if you wanna do an overall 55-45 split of this marital estate, it's going to tell you exactly what you need to either move so you can move things around. Let's give Taylor the house. And now we need another 40,000. 41,000. So let's do 41,000 here to Taylor. And now we're down to $723. Now you can leave that as an equalization. You can ignore that because it's a small amount. Um, or you can continue to fiddle with the numbers until you get that exactly to zero. And, and often it won't be exactly zero, it might be a one because of rounding. But um, be that as it may, now you've got your allocation. You can also do different scenarios side by side. So we can go into property division scenarios and we can go side by side and add a scenario. You can change the value of an asset if that's a, an issue, or you can change who's keeping the house, who's not keeping the house. So here, let's say Taylor keeps home. Okay. And we have different scenarios and you can move things around at, as much as you want within this um, group. The actual column, the first column, is what is going to show, um, is what's going to show on the um, marital property division report that I showed you earlier. And these other scenarios are just internal to the program. So let's say we keep put, you know, we're we're moving stuff around and I like scenario number one. So I can swap the actual for scenario one and it will literally flip those two columns. And now this is the actual with the value of the home being 400,000. And that is what's gonna show on that division of marital property worksheet. So here we have the house with a value of 400,000. So it's very, very handy um, to be able to do these side-by-side -side scenarios. It's great for mediations, ENEs, working with your client um, or working with the other attorney to settle a case. Let's talk about some other analysis tools. 
that I find very handy. Um, we can divide property on an after-tax basis. So the program's automatically going to calculate, including all the assumptions, marginal tax rate at retirement, and also a current capital gains rate. Now, for a current capital gains rate, you have to know the basis. Otherwise, it's not going to be accurate. Um, and sometimes clients don't know the basis, but it's, it's good to have if you know that stuff. And the marginal tax rate of retirement is going to be based on when you said they're going to retire, what income increases and so on are going to be. And all of those are settings and assumptions. And I go over that in the advanced training. Um, it's too complicated to go over here. And so then if we go down to, um, let's pick an asset that has a retirement uh, calculation in it. Here we have 52.8 in the Fidelity IR, uh, Fidelity 401k. And um, Blake is getting 100% of it, but he's going to be paying 28.80 in taxes. So it's only worth 37.594 to him. If we were to change that and give them each 50 50, now you're going to see that. Um, Taylor's tax is lower than Blake's. So her 50% her interest is going to be worth more than his 50% interest um, because they're paying different tax amounts. So it's good to sometimes look at those things. Um, and the program is very accurate. Uh, let's talk about setting alimony. So now I probably messed this up. But I'm going to go to the spousal maintenance break even tool, which is in the spousal maintenance section of the analysis um, uh, tab or, or um, topic. And then it's in more. We go to spousal maintenance break even, and it would tell you exactly what the number is. And I added, of course, some extra income for Taylor here. So if I go back to the enter data, let's go back into the income and expense. Let's take out this 25,000 for Taylor and see what happens on our spousal maintenance break even. Now she's still got enough to make it, but be that as it may, um, if there was an amount there, you would see it here. So that's sometimes a good starting point on what should maintenance be. Sometimes it's unrealistic because this break-even number is based on the recipient's own income and expenses. So if the expenses are a little bit inflated, I know your clients would never majorly inflate their expenses um, or the other side would never do that. Um, you'll see um, a number there. Now we can do a couple of other ways of figuring out what the right maintenance number should be. We can go to meet recipients need. And again, here we can show side-by-side -side columns. And this is going to be looking at the desired after-tax income to the recipient. So let's say that we want the recipient to get 70,000 a year. This is what she would need in maintenance or maybe 50,000 a year what would she need in maintenance? Now we're down to almost nothing, right? And I can show the results either in a short detail report or I can, um, I can do it in a expanded report, which for you Minnesota users who maybe used FinPlan in the past, this gives you a FinPlan looking report. And we also have another way of determining alimony or maintenance, and that is by percentage of after-tax income. So we've got their combined after-tax income. How do you want to allocate it? Do we want it to be 50-50? Um, you know, certainly Taylor might say yes, but Blake says no. So let's see what 40-60 would, would look like. And you can just keep doing side-by-side -side scenarios where you can edit the scenarios very easily and see the difference. And again, you can see a, 
short detail report, or you can see an expanded fin plan looking report. We also do present value of maintenance. So now here's the kicker. You want to use either the actual or um, any subset, any, any scenario you want. So let's say what would 2,300 a month for 92 months look like? And it'll automatically give you the amount the really the only variable here is the pre-tax interest rate. And so that has um, really um, basically is giving you the um, option here to change that rate. And you can click on a little question mark. It'll tell you we're using a T-bond rate. But let's say rates go up we're gonna increase this when rates go up. But if you wanna see what a different rate would look like, we can do two separate rates here and it'll give you two separate numbers um, based on those rates. Okay, now, once you get a maintenance amount, you wanna go back into the enter data page to the support data page and then scroll down to the bottom section, spousal maintenance to use. And that's where you're gonna put in the number that you have settled on for that spousal maintenance. You can put it in right here under spousal maintenance to use. And then that's what the program is gonna use in all the budgets and projections and so on. So that'll be really good. Let's say it's gonna be 33. Um, okay, it's gonna be 10 years of maintenance. It's gonna automatically give you a present value based on those entries. And um, again, you can change the discount rate and it'll be different for each of them or you can keep the discount rate the same. And because alimony is no longer taxable, you check the boxes here that it's non-taxable, non-deductible, um, it'll give you a present value. Okay, now uh, let's go to the next uh, analysis, which is our what if for support. Sometimes when it comes to child support, there's a lot of different variables and there's not just one number for support. It depends on who has the children, who's the majority time parent, um, <laughs> what are the overnights. So you can do here again in the what if for child support page, side-by-side -side scenarios with the same label ability and swap feature that we saw in the property division. And that can really be fun You can do side by side with different overnights, or you could do side by side with different incomes, or you can do side by side with like, all these different um, variables here. And it'll give you the support amount. And if it changes the maintenance amount, you would want to change that too. But uh, presumably, you'll this will copy over whatever was in one. When I created this, I didn't have anything in the maintenance amount, so it didn't copy over any, so I have to add it in. Or I can just delete the, um, the scenario. And now when I create new ones, yes. When I create new scenarios, it's gonna copy over everything that I have here and then make those changes. Okay, um, there's other functionality in the program, tons of it. Um, let's talk for a minute about support arrears. If you wanna calculate support arrears with interest, you can do that very simply and get a report. And the report comes with all kinds of backup data 
um, and sub reports on the uh, accumulation of your rearage on the interest. Um, so it's very handy for that. We also do a present value of pension plans. And this, of course, requires some assumptions and information. So you put in the information that you have, check the box to have a software value plan, and then go into more information. And in more information, we're really looking at two major variables in the value of a pension. We're looking again at the discount rate. And again, we're using a 20-year T-bill rate. We'll update it when the rates change. Um, however, be aware that um, you may want to play around with that rate. And then we also have mortality tables. Now, we have a nine mortality tables built into the program. Um, the question is, which one do you use? And since we're, I'm not an actuary, um, and, and unless you really know what these are, um, we have little hints. So we have these little short, just one clause hint, and then you can click on the question mark or click on more information and it will tell you more about each mortality table and allow you to then make an educated guess as to which one you should use. I generally use the first one, which is the most recent table. Um, and, um, but interestingly enough, here's the pension value, which is 185, okay? If I change the mortality table, it changes the value. So we went from 185 to 157 by changing the mortality table. And as you change them, you'll see different values. So we can't tell you which one to use, but we can give you information about it. We also automatically calculate the coverture fraction based on the dates that you put in. And then we, uh, so let's say that they started in the plan in 2013 and they were married in 2017. And let's make the cutoff date the end of this month. And bam, now our coverture fraction is 78.95. And I can actually see that calculation by how many days for the numerator and the denominator. So it is a very, you can use that for other things too, of course. Um, so it will give you a pension payment. And if you go out enough years to reach their retirement age, it will show you how the benefits are going to be allocated between them. So that is um, a really cool, complete pension value. And we have reports that you can provide either to the client, to their accountant, to the other side about the pension valuation. Um, obviously you can't really use it for trial, but you can use it for every other purpose. And I, in over 40 years of practice, I've only had one trial on pension valuation as an issue uh, in that trial. So, and that guy was a cop and he, didn't want to split the pension at all, as cops are wont to do. Okay, so we have a few more minutes. Um, if you have any questions, if there's anything you would like me to cover that I haven't covered, please feel free to put in a Q&A or just ask me in the chat. Um, and I think I can actually even unmute you if necessary. Um, do we have any questions? Is there anything I haven't covered? So I've gone over basically um, on a superficial level. There's a lot of depth here, um, everything in the program. Um, I want to thank you for coming today. And if there's any questions or anything else that I can show you, please let me know. Otherwise, I think we're done for today.